Hello, everybody. It's, a, it's about seven o'clock, so I'm going to uh, get started so we can make it through the evening on schedule. Really happy to see folks here. Come on, and there's some more chairs in front if anybody's looking for a seat. We um, also have some folks we want to welcome on the Zoom um, program as well. So uh, good to see you all coming out on a pretty inclement weather period we're having here, but right now it's not raining, so that's good. Uh, it kind of changes about every five minutes. Um, so my name is Mavis Souls, and we wanted to welcome you, and uh, we're excited to see um, Ron Popish again. Dennis will an announce um, his talk in a minute, and next month's talk as well. Um, I did want to tell you that we have um, scheduled a bike path cleanup. Uh, we've done this several years in a row, and it, um, it, we weren't able to get it in the April newsletter because we were trying to negotiate the dates with the Bureau of Land Management that manages out at West Eugene Wetlands. They're going to help us by bringing equipment and hauling the trash away, which is a big deal. So we're really happy to have them helping us with that. But it's going to be April 28th from nine to noon, that's a Sunday. And um, we have a contact person that you can sign up for um, joining us, it's it's kind of fun. You can also bird watch while you're doing the bike path cleanup. And we do actually see really good birds out there. So it's kind of good fun on um, both ways. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. And um, also so the audience um, on Zoom, like I said, we didn't get it in the upcoming um, newsletter, but. We have it on Facebook and we have it on the website and then we'll spread the word as we can. So I think we're ready to move on into uh, Dennis Art. Thanks again for coming. Well, good evening. I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, one, I, I thought I would just make an odd announcement and that I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Wednesday group, which meets on Wednesdays. And uh, the weather is supposed to really be bad tomorrow. so. If you're a member of the Wednesday group and you're planning on coming out tomorrow, if it's raining tomorrow morning, stay home. Um, I'm going to go out anyway because uh, we never cancel anything. But if it's raining when we get out there, we're going to the north end of uh, Mount Pisgah. Uh, if it's raining at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's supposed to just get worse until about noon. And so uh, I'll probably just turn around and we'll go get a cup of coffee somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, that's a, a Wednesday group uh, announcement. Next month, next month we have um, a speaker who is uh, fairly new to Eugene. He came here a couple of years ago, um, and he is one of those guys who's uh, always been interested in nature. He studied grizzly bears and um, great gray owls and things like that in the uh, Jackson Hole area. His name is Tim Griffith. You probably know him. He's been leading a lot of the uh, bird walks for. Wild Birds Unlimited, and he did a talk here um, a couple of months ago in the fall, October, you know, something like that. Uh, so he's, he's fairly well known. And he's going to talk about his backyard. Now, he, he came here, bought a new house, backyard like a lot of new houses, just a piece of scraped land, really kind of a mess. And he took that and turned it into a wildlife refuge. And he's going to talk about that process and how he did it, what kind of plants he used, where he got help, and show us a little bit about what the results were of his hard work. So it's real exciting. I'm going to come with my notepad and write down names of things and figure out some things so that I can do uh, some similar, similar things in my backyard. Well, tonight, tonight, who do we have tonight? Uh, Ron Papish. Ron Papish has been here. I think this is the sixth uh, program he's done for us. I remember the first uh, program was uh, Bogusloff Island, an island uh, I'll never forget because uh, he took us to this island out in the Aleutian chain and told us about all the birds there and everything. And then he leaves the island and the island blows up and becomes a big crater. And it was just an amazing story where we were all just enthralled with it. He also took us to India on another trip with his wife, Dawn. He also took us to the grizzly bears in Alaska, where we saw the amazing photographs of grizzly bears catching fish and doing all kinds of things and how the grizzly bears have names. And it was quite amazing. 
He also took us to an odd place, like an alligator farm in Florida. And why would you go to him? Well, you know, that was a lot of fun because they learned a lot about places that you normally wouldn't think about. They go and see birds. And it was a place where you could get in early and you could see the birds without having all the other people there and get great photographs. So it was just another great program. So, I, you know, we've got to get Ron back again. So uh, we were talking about what kind of things we wanted Ron to show us. He's He's been just got back from a trip to Japan. And we were talking about that before the program. I gotta gotta have him back to do uh, some a program about that. But in in the meantime, we got this idea of just talking about the art that Ram does. We we don't get to see that side of him very often. We get to see the adventures and all the great things. But but he's an artist, and he's done things all over Oregon, and he's done illustrations and books, and he's done sculptures and uh, ceramic art and all sorts of things. And I thought, by golly, we got to see more of that. So let's give a nice warm welcome to Ron Papish. Oh, and you got to look at his pants. Got to look at his pants. Oh, all right. Let's see. Can you hear me okay? Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. I think we'll just jump right into the program here. And um, our story starts uh, my first day of class as a freshman at Cornell University, a basic design class. And the professor told the class that all art must be a reflection of the human condition. And I thought, that's the BS, man. Um, so for myself, art uh, has always been um, a way of connecting people to their surroundings and to be more specific to connect them to the natural world. So that's what my artwork is about, and that's what tonight's program is about. So this first image is very typical of my style. OK, it's uh, educational in nature and it attempts to show uh, people uh, aspects of nature that they don't get to see. OK, uh, and I often do these images where there's um, above the water, below the water and even underground. I do a lot of this type of thing and I do a lot of complex images with a lot of different wildlife on them. OK, this is over in Yaquina Bay. That's what this image depicts. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, through the years, I've done a lot of different artwork and publications, and I've settled on a, a niche that is most of my business these days. It's interpretive panels, okay? So these are the panels that you see at, at wayside exhibits or along trails in natural areas. In fact, I walked out just before this presentation, saw some interpretive panels right out here on the trail outside this building. So that's the main thing I do. And um, I do the writing and design and so forth, but my obviously my specialty is illustrating these. And here's an example. There's the painting I do, I, I did for this particular one. And then there's the finished panel with the text on, okay? So that's, that's, that's what I do. I don't know, that's probably 90% of my business now, okay? Um, so I have a background in birding since I was a teenager here in Eugene. And I uh, have done uh, a number of field guides and so forth over the years. So what I'm getting at here is I pride myself on being scientifically accurate, okay? This is from the handbook of Oregon birds, I believe. So, and, and you know, you can't take that for granted. Uh, sometimes you go and you see things that, well, there's this sign over at Ankeny, I don't want to mention that has it, well, anyway. <laughs> Okay, so how to create these paintings, so this is the, a cover of a book on plovers, and they wanted every plover in the world on here. So this is just, 
you know, that's all right. This can get a little fussy. So what I did here, this is just a few years ago, but I was still using this technique where I had every different head and they had to be all to scale with each other. So I was going to my copy machine with the drawing and uh, going plus 2%, minus 3% to get these all exactly the right size and in the right position. And I'm using cellophane tape and moving these things around. Okay, so later in the program, you'll see some of my techniques I've adopted just in the last few years that are very helpful. So that's the beginning. And then here's that painting in progress. Um, I start with a, a watercolor technique, wet the paper. This is actually a fluid acrylic is what I'm using here, but I use it like a watercolor at this stage. Get that paper wet. Um, hey, I'm going to try to use this pointer here. Whoops, that just advanced it. Hmm. Well, they said I need to get the hang of this. I'm not sure I'm going to. But anyway, there's the rock. And then over on the right side, let's see, yeah, your right side, that's called blocking. I'm just, you know, roughing in the, the, the colors there. And here's your final product, okay? So there's all the uh, covers of the world in their appropriate places. So, you know, just this was just last week. So I was out to dinner with some friends, uh, uh, someone I had just met, and he asked me, when did you know that you wanted to be an artist? <laughs> no one's ever asked me that question. So I sat there. I didn't just blurt out. I actually thought about this. Not like my usual technique of just blurting things out. So I thought about it, and I, and I figured it out. It was in sixth grade when I did this drawing. Okay. And... So we were encouraged to enter this uh, art contest for a, like an art and literature magazine in Mendocino, California. You see, I was 12 years old. And frankly, I don't know why I got second place, but uh, that's another story. So after this was, I won second place. It was published and girls in class were actually acknowledging my existence. And I was getting all sorts of attention. And I said, Hey, I want to be an artist. So here it is. Here's your, there it is, published. Yeah, you know, there's some pretty good detail in those fangs there. Make a good neck tattoo, I think. Um, so throughout uh, middle school and high school, I love getting published. I love, love, love seeing my work in print. So I, I submitted to lots of these literary magazines and art magazines and books and compilations and so forth. This is 14. You can see at that age, I could just naturally draw very realistically. Okay. And interestingly, I mostly um, um, focused on birds now. Uh, I do a lot of other things as well. But back then, I was I, I spent my childhood obsessed with catching snakes. So we got the snake and the skull, and we got this snake. Here's a portrait of me at 14 during my Escher stage, okay. And look at that thick wash hair. That's a... <laughs> so when I was 19, uh, Alan Contreras, who's in the room tonight, he asked me to illustrate this uh, Birds of Oregon book that he was writing with some of his colleagues. So that was a big deal to me. I was like, this is my first book. I So I did a, quite a few illustrations for that. And uh, this is the cover. Now, you know, I'm not up here just to toot my own horn, okay? This is not that great a painting, okay? Look at th that that foot on that puffin is way too big, and so is the head. But heck, I was, you know, I was a teenager. Give me a break. Okay, so I'm going to, um, let's see, the host has spotlighted your video for everyone. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to, you know, feature a... Uh, a large project that I recently did on the coast, um, because I figured some of you may have seen these panels on visits to the coast, okay? So this was paid for by the New Carissa oil spill settlement. Yes, and it uh, involves, let's see, it's 67 panels along the coast. Um, I was well qualified to, to work on these as the illustrator uh, because I had spent quite a few years studying seabirds in Oregon, and but mostly in Alaska. So I'm uh, very familiar with these birds. This is These are pictures of me doing field work. So 
uh, along the coast before these signs, people saw all sorts of different stuff. You can see these don't match uh, at all. They're just a hodgepodge of different things. So the idea was to have a similar look throughout. And a, a lot of the, the signs were falling apart. This is kind of the old school style of doing a sign with the, the small black and white illustrations and the rust in the frame. <laughs> So for this series, we did illustrated backgrounds, which is what you see here, like a, um, a, a painting that goes across the whole panel, um, as you see here, and then profile cuts, which, you know, the modern technology lets us cut the, the panels into the shape of the animal or whatever you want popping off the side adds a little interest. We have these icons on each one that has like a uh, what you can do t-shirt, and then each of these has a blue wave on the bottom. So look for these next time you're over on the coast. Here's a typical one. Uh, I did uh, a bunch of different photo. Um, uh, well, several of my photographs are used on here. And then I did a bunch of illustrations that are on the map there. And so all those elements are present. Okay, so this is up at Cape Mears. Most of you are familiar with that area. And this was their sign with a, that is actually not a lump of coal. That is a map. So that's what we were replacing. And here's the modern look. We have the um, the photographs, uh, the illustrations, and it's all working together nicely. If you look closely, can anyone see the marbled merlet in that tree? Okay, good job. It's on the lowest branch. Um, yeah, there you are. Okay, so this is uh, the initial sketch that I would give to the client. It's just a pencil drawing. This is of a, a very active seabird colony like you might see at Cape Mears. And here I'm working on the painting and you can see this one is so long it won't fit on my desk. I gotta scoot it, wrap it around onto the wall there. So I don't know, it's about six feet long. Um, and there's the final panel. So uh, as much as possible, I like to show birds in action, uh, show their behavior and you can see uh, these uh, particular birds are engaged in all sorts of characteristic um, breeding activities. Here's another one from that series featuring the profile cut. You see all those birds popping off there, add some interest and excitement to get people, you know, what you want is you want people to look at these things. So here, this one is uh, mounted down at Harris Beach State Park, and uh, it shows where all the, the seabird colonies are in the state. I mentioned I like to show things that people don't get to see. So here we are out in some huge swells in the middle of winter, seeing seabirds in their winter plumage. So that's what this one's about. There you go. Well, this was interesting. We took that profile cut aspect that I was talking about earlier to its logical extreme. And we just said, well, why don't we just make the whole panel the shape of the animal? So that's what this is, a hermit crab. Um, there's tide pool sculpin. I thought this worked out very nicely. I think I'll do more of this in the future. So this, this project was completed just what was in uh, 2018, 2019. Okay. So I mentioned I had done a lot of work with seabirds through the years and pretty familiar with their behaviors. So this... Uh, panel is going to be about seabird disturbance, how to prevent it. Okay, that was a big part of this project is to mitigate the oil spill by helping seabirds in some way. So here we have a depiction of the head bobbing behavior that MERS do when they're disturbed. I submitted this drawing to the client and she said, no one knows what they're doing. They just look like they're looking at that Unabomber guy there climbing up. And I said, well, that's what they do. It says, okay, no, we need we need to make this more clear to the viewer. Okay. So then I said, well, what about something like this? <laughs> and they said, well, we don't want to freak people out. This is a really scary image. This is like from a horror film. I don't know. I guess nothing where the, the chick is actually being ingested. I think that would it was the, the rule of thumb there. Okay, so here's the drawing that was actually accepted here. We got the guy climbing up. We have the um, the MERS flying off and the secondary predators, the gulls and, and crows and so forth moving in. 
to eat the feed on the eggs. So there's the painting and uh, the finished panel, actually. I think that that's scary enough. Yeah, that gets the point across. So uh, having completed this one, they wanted uh, a similar panel at other sites, but they would they said, well, well at this other place, we don't have any MERS. Like, well, okay, you want me to do a whole new design? It's not necessary. You see here, I just did separate paintings of those cormorants, got rid of the MERS, and you can see I used the same painting, and just in Photoshop, this is what you can do these days. I had a few, I got the oyster catcher on there, you know, it's the drone up in the corner. So I ended up, and then here's another one. Here, that's without the oyster catcher, okay? So we, I was able to make custom panels of this same idea that fit the, each location where they were needed. Okay, well, a similar situation. Here's a, uh, this is down at Harris Beach State Park where they have a lot of kayakers uh, disturbing the seals. So we did that. But then at another site, they said, well, we don't have kayakers. We have people taking pictures. So there's my wife. I uh, said, hey, Dawn, pretend like you're taking a picture of a seal. So I got her to do that. And there she is. And uh, I changed her vest color and stuff. But that's basically it. She's back there taking a picture of the seals. All right, so um, continuing with that theme of trying to illustrate things that are, are difficult to see, um, uh, I did some research on Casson's Auklet and all the different displays they do at the beginning of the breeding season, which is quite fascinating. And this is an illustration from a, a scientific journal showing some of those different uh, behaviors that they uh take part in during that that uh, pre-breeding period. And after studying that, I was able to put together this sketch showing us all this, all the different um, crazy poses and maneuvers that they undertake. So that became this painting. Yeah. And it's nice to be able to show something that you'll never see a photograph of, and you'll never see a, a photograph of this. So this uh, appears in Newport, where I live, and it's on the Yaquina Bay State Park. And this is two large panels, about six foot long, that actually kind of go together, so it combines for a 12-foot image. Here's those big paintings. Again, it's hard to fit this stuff on my desk. It's wrapping all around the walls here. This is uh, showing that what, what's going on under the water, a herring spawn and various species that that attracts. And this is this was about how um, people's actions can sometimes help wildlife here in the Bay. There you go. There's the, the panel out of the action. All right. So this is a very unattractive restroom at Sunset Bay State Park, we saw this thing. It's like, let's try to cover up as much of that wall as we can. So we did a, a quite a large, I think this is like a 10-foot panel there. That was my initial sketch. It's about tide pool etiquette. So uh, the, the client wanted the, the um, people a little bit more featured. So that was the adjusted sketch. And there's the final painting. Yeah, that one, uh, that one took a while to paint. Yeah. There it is. Okay, this is the last one I'm going to show you from this series. And this kiosk here is a good example of the old school style of doing panels. It's got small photographs, um, lots of text, not very visually engaging. So, uh, you know, I've seen too many people walk by that, things like that. So here we're developing the design. Uh, this is, this was, you know, this is an incredible site um, at Simpson Reef where there's five different species of pinnipeds that haul up there. So I was trying to show different things. They said, oh, you can't just have pinnipeds. You need to have a bird on it. That's part of our. So I got a loon in there that still wasn't working. So then I said, well, let's just do a kelp forest and I can have birds there, too. They can just be flying underwater. Okay. So that's the design that, that was approved, and I had kind of a separate panel off to the side for a map. Okay. And there's that final painting.
Yeah, that that was a that's was very popular. So there's the before, and then there's the after. Okay, so I showed you the little pieces of paper that I was photocopying on it. So this was the first time I actually did my initial sketch partly on the computer. I did a pencil drawing. You can see the pencil marks. Then I scanned. I'm like, well, I could just put this color on on the computer. And this was 2018, so that was a new thing. And I've kind of run with that since. But mm -hmm. you can see it let, lets you get give the client a better idea of what the final painting is going to look like. Part of this same funding um, cycle was to add some seabirds uh, exhibits to this uh, visitor's center in Southern Oregon called Chrissy Field. It's a fabulous building. Um, so the, it was a different company that had this contract and they, they contacted me and asked if I could do some sculptures for this of seabirds. And I said, um, well, I've never done that before, but yes, I absolutely can. So we're going to see how that ended up. This is the visitor center, nothing about wildlife or birds in this. So this little corner became this. So that I did that, that painting back there that uh, this is called the kids corner. So it has various activities to engage them. And then this big wall with seabirds uh, with a lot to say. So the, I don't, let me, let me go back for a second. You see that big shelf up there with that looks like the potential seabird colony to me. So that's the direction we went with this. And there's my little sketch showing where I thought the seabirds could go. And the the decision was made not to do a mural behind which i think would have been better but to have a, a photograph of a seabird colony and then have the sculptures in front so i figured out how to i did a little bit of sculpture in my background but not really so i had to learn how to do this it's called youtube okay <laughs> so uh i'm fabricating these seabirds that's the armature that you see there and then um one of the seabirds further along i'm using yeah uh, you know, masking tape. I got some um, aluminum foil bunched up to bulk out the item. And then I, I, I did a combination of uh, drywall joint compound with shredded toilet paper and Elmer's glue. And that was what I covered these with. And I actually was able to sculpt. And as you can see, we're getting a lot of detail and realism in these. Here's the myrrh with its egg. And I could even get down into the feet and do the, the, the fine veining in the webbing. The gray material is a, a, a much stronger compound that I used on the legs and so forth, anywhere where I needed some strength. Oh my God, my wife came home one day and saw this. Like, what are you doing to these birds? It's a layering process. You got to hang stuff out to dry, okay? And then I needed rocks for them to go on. And really, rocks can be made from a variety of things. I, was, I needed some, 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 you know, just structure to build into these rocks. So I saw, I saw an old doghouse in our backyard. And I got out a chainsaw and cut that thing up. And that's what you're seeing here, parts of a doghouse um, converted into rock. And I used real grasses. And let me tell you, guano is easy to produce. It's not a hard thing to, to render at all. So here's the, the finished MERS on their rocky ground that they're on. Yeah, showing some behavior. This is a MER coming and feeding its chip. And then for these Brant's cormorants, you can see I have one there in, in breeding display. They have their... They're in peak breeding condition with those plumes coming out, which are actually uh, a friend of mine went turkey hunting. And I said, what are you doing with that bird's feathers? So those are actually the, 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 the shafts of turkey feathers that you see here. Oh, yeah, That's, this is the long call of a Western gull. So I had to drive down to uh, Chrissy Field to put the display together, okay? So I put these sculptures in the back of my truck and got an outstanding compliment. 
while I was doing that. Here I'm walking back in the bathroom and I had a girl trying to mate with my sculpture. I've never been more proud. There you can actually see under it the, the piece of the uh, dog house with a little bit of dry rot and so forth. <laughs> We're just lifting that up into place. So there's the before and the after. Thanks. Yeah, I, I love trying new things like that. Uh, a couple of children's books I did some years ago. Let's just take a quick look at that. Um, you know, at one point I, I really wanted to do children's books, but children's books with a, a natural history orientation like this, they, this universally don't sell very well and um so i, I kind of moved on from that idea but they're very fun to do and you can see this is very typical of my style and it's like showing cutaways of the various the nesting crevices and cavities and so forth of a busy seabird colony in alaska okay this is from the the book the little seal it's this is a a, the initial sketch I did, I said, well, this isn't having enough impact. So you can see I just drew a, a square around the heads. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just draw, focus in on that tighter action. And I said, no, I don't like that either. So then I said, we got to have that action coming right toward the viewer with a big splash. So I kind of settled on this concept here. So there I'm starting the, the drawing on paper. A little bit of pen work. I'm studying the inside of the mouth of some of these seals that attacked me while I was up there. And that, and then this is the beginning of the final painting, that wash stage that I referred to earlier. And at this stage, you want to just splash a lot of paint on there. You want to do it with a lot of energy. You don't have to care too much about what colors you're putting down on there. Uh, and you can see this is a very energetic look to it. Now, as you do more detail and tighten it up, a lot of that's lost, but there's a little bit of that energy still showing through. And some of those initial colors that you put on are poking through here and there. Like you can see the blue in the mouth. And then in the final, you can see some of that color showing through. And of course, for these, th these are double page spreads in the book. So you always have to design it in two halves where the you know the gutter going down the middle and then you need a spot for the text in this case it's where the splash is okay this is over at the hatfield marine science center in newport the uh, director there had a donation of some walrus tusks they they wanted me to figure out how to help display them so i said okay well let's do a glass case i'll do a a walrus sculpture on top of that we'll actually use the the the, the tusks on this thing so this was my original concept and they rather liked that but they said you know you know we have other pinnipeds around here too we got sea lion california stellar sea lion and I said well okay although i can do those too let's just include those so this was the design we settled on and they were concerned about people pulling on the walrus tusks so you can see i put the walrus above teenage boy jumping range, which is about 10 and a half feet, okay? So I guess you're wondering, is it, how are you, what's going on here? Is this gonna like pop out of the wall or something? Like, how are we gonna display those tusks? Well, in fact, it is gonna pop out of the wall. You'll just wait and see here. So here's the mural, blocking it in, got the scaffolding. Uh, there you can see I'm blocking the colors in. This is an example of that work where I'm at this stage, I'm just getting the three dimensionality of that head. And then on top of that, I do the details. And so that's just the, then here's the walrus where I have to display the tusks. So like this was just problem solving. I'm like, I got to figure out how to do this. So this is back in my garage. I had to, I actually happen to have a walrus skull laying around, don't ask. Um, and so I modeled it after that. I got wood and some metal there, and I wanted to make sure these things didn't fall out. So I drilled through there. I put the cable through that tusk. Duct tape is good for everything. You know, it's just that people know that. So here I have hardware cloth. 
uh, aluminum foil duct tape. There's like a bird toy I stuck in for the eyeball for pet birds, you know. Uh, and then I'm doing the paper mache and attaching that right to the wall. I got out that um, drywall spackle again, and I'm working on the the texture of the skin on this walrus. You can see it is popping out of the wall. And there's the finished. <laughs> Pretty realistic. I got more uh, um, quills from another turkey there making the whiskers on this thing. So <laughs> worked out pretty well. This is a, um, a large painting uh, I did for the intensive care unit of a Samaritan hospital in Newport. So this is the initial design. The concept behind this was as people were do recovering, they needed a place to walk to, like a destination, and then something to do when they got there. So that's the idea here is as they're able to walk around, they go take a look at this mural, and it's very detailed, so they have something to study. This is on four, um, yeah, four eight by six panels, I think this was. And this shows the process with a, a finished panel and then with that one that I'm just starting to block in. So pay, this is in my studio at home. Um, and when you get something this big, it's it's a little awkward to reach all the different spots. Of it. You can see I'm comfy, though, in my jammies and so forth here. And I'm not making a great fashion statement in this picture, but we'll move on. Okay, so that's this. This is again showing the the process with some of the panels finished, and others in progress. And there's the final painting in the hospital. So, oh, okay. You know, uh, I'm showing a variety of things in here, and basically, I just decided to include what I thought would be fun. Okay, there I've done a lot of different artwork, and just these are the some fun things I wanted to include it. So through the years, I've done a little bit of work with kids, but they're so natural at doing artwork. I don't like to do too much instruction. They have great instincts for color and how to do things. Um, but one, one problem is they tend to overwork things. So what I found is when I'm doing murals with kids, my main task is to run, a, run around and say, okay, that's enough. That's good right there. Stop. So did that quite extensively but they do stuff that i can't get away with like look at this seal with the rainbow on it and look at the color on that octopus they can do that and i think it looks great but i can't do that i almost feel like i'm using them or something to make these images so this is from just last summer and this is um up in alaska i work with on various islands up there and the the kids up there are Aleut heritage and this is about their their connection with their island that they're that they live on. Interestingly, on this mural and this one, they both uh, wanted to include scientists uh, because they have uh, scientists coming out to study seabirds on their islands each summer. So um, to develop these, I started with talking to the kids about what they wanted on there, and then I'd sketch it out. So they got very specific, like for this. I want two puffins on the water with a bright sunset behind it. Like, well, that's fine. We'll throw that in. <laughs> so anyway, I like the results on these two. Uh, recent, this was from the year before in St. George Island. Okay, these are some ceramic pieces. This is These are done with a, a technique of painting black slip, it's called, on the, the greenware, which is before it's fired and then scratching out the design with a sharp instrument. And I just love the, the process of doing this. It's just, to me, it's extremely satisfying to scratch things. You know, each little scratch on there, oh, that's fun. I love doing that. So you can see that you get the very sharp looking results by scratching and little, little slivers of the clay fly off with each scratch that you do, okay? So, uh, this was for NOAA, and it's depicting the um, threatened and endangered species that they're in charge of. Bearded seal here. Northern sea otter. And um, I didn't end up doing the, um, I didn't do the actual throwing of the pots. I, I got someone else to do that. I just wanted to do the surface work. Here's the display at the Hatfield Marine Science uh, center visitors center. 
There you go. And some of that's still over there if you have a chance to, to visit the Newport area. And the rest of it's at the center in Washington. Okay, so I mentioned I just wanted to show you a lot of the fun variety of things that I've worked on through the years. And um, a few years back, I uh, someone asked me to do a marine debris sculpture. And I actually had done a couple of these. And I so I took this on. And um, that was what I had. I had started working on it. But let me tell you, it was hard to find enough garbage. I was going out on the beach and looking for stuff and collecting it. Our beaches are too clean here. It's terrible. Um, so I, I ended up collaborating with Elizabeth Roberts, who's pictured here. And uh, she's done a lot of this type of work in the past. And also, very importantly, she had a whole barn full of marine debris that she had collected and organized. So we worked on this together. And here we're bulking out the, the fish. And she actually is much more of an expert at this than I am and uh, couldn't have done it without her. But you can see the level of detail we're getting in here. This like um, the tight um, sewing of the, the each vein in this fin and the scaling. So this is marine debris. We're cutting it up. So what you want is you want to kind of transform all this into you want the, the the pieces, the debris to like lose their identity so that it all works together. And that's what we have here, a striped bass. This was for some museum in New York. I don't know how they got my number. Um, but at the, so I mentioned you want to transform this stuff, but you also want it to be some pieces to be recognizable. So when people walk up to it, they can um, see the individual. Like here you can see some little wheels oh here we are posing nicely with our sculpture but uh, if you look right in the middle you can see there's a flip-flop there's various lids and so forth that are straight off the beach okay lighters are a common thing we got some shotgun shells doubling as uh, some kelp and so forth yeah All right, so I mentioned I'm using some new techniques, and so I'm now doing uh, some drawings on the computer. Okay, so we're going to, uh, and I draw directly on the screen for these in Photoshop. So we'll look at the technique here. Excuse me. It's done in layers. So this is the line layer, and then the fill layer is what this is called. So that's uh, uh, the color is done underneath. And if you're wondering why there's a little bit of color on that wren there, it's because I messed up. I, that was just a mistake. I put the color on the wrong layer, okay? So anyway, you put those two together and there's your final drawing. These are some, you know, yeah. these small panels are, oh, you like the puns on here? I wrote those too, just in case you're wondering. Um, yeah, so these are just small, like nine by 12 panels that you can put along trails. So people want to keep walking, they can just quickly read these and keep moving. All right, so the the advantage to doing this these the work on the computer I thought would be to save time. Okay, um, you could you kind of whip these out and maybe do them in half the time, but uh, I'm not so sure. Take a look at the detail on this one. This whole thing was drawn on the computer, and I'm getting in there. And I wow, I can zoom this up ten times and do all sorts of detail. I can do each vein in the leaf and the highlights on the leaf. So I don't think I'm, I think this may take more time backfiring on me. So, but this one strikes a good center point between, you know, there's some detail on here, but not too much. This was drawn entirely on the computer, just right on the screen with a stylus. So, uh, and here again, this was another uh, drawing I did on the computer. So I'm trying to strike a balance between doing about fifth, uh, half the paint, uh, half of the artwork with traditional media and half on the computer. And that's what I'm doing these days. Oh, but where the, the, doing this work on the computer is really coming in handy is in the initial designs because I can get to a color mock-up like this quite quickly. I'm, you can throw in colors really fast. So this is just the rough sketch, folks. Okay. 
that I and I'm so I'm able to deliver this to the client instead of just a pencil drawing. And there's the final painting. A lot going on there. I'm glad I didn't have to do it on separate pieces of photocopy paper. Here again, that's the um, initial sketch that I delivered to the client. And then there's the final painting. And it has like 10 times as much detail on it. Although the color on that looks pretty good, doesn't it? So this raises a problem. Is the client, I deliver the rough draft and they think it's the final. So now I have to deliver, give them something like this at the same time. Like you're looking at a rough draft. This is an example of a rough draft versus a final painting. So I just throw this in with the rough draft so they know where we're going. Okay. So you can see that there's the process there. Throwing together that quick rough and then the final. Okay. So this was uh, uh, very recently. This is a 50 foot long drawing by eight feet tall. So this is for a mobile display that's going to be taken to uh, expos and state fairs and so forth all across the Great Plains area. And it's to educate people, uh, mostly to um, get ranchers and um, other working lands um, to, you know, keep invasive plants off of their lands that they're using. So that's what the, the, the goal of this was. But um, for me, I was like, how do I do this? I can't, if I painted this, I have to scan each bit of a 50 foot mural on a, you know, my scanner is only 12 by 17. It would be nearly impossible to do that. So it's much, be doing it on the computer enables me to, to do something like this. You can hardly see this. Let's get a better close up here. So that's just one of the six panels there. You can see the level of detail on this. And uh, I had a tight deadline on this before I went on that trip to Japan that Dennis was just mentioning. So I worked on this thing for three weeks for 16 to 18 hours a day for seven days a week. And I added that up and it was like 350 hours. Uh, but hey, I, it was worth it. So that that this is the ideal Great Plains Prairie scene. And then this is with the introduced red cedar moving in you can see i'm just throwing in a, a lousy raccoon and a couple you know turkey vultures and stuff as compared to all this native habitat so there you can see the detail and with a, each one of these uh eight by eight squares drawn something like that you might have 200 layers on it. so each of these like groups of flowers and so forth I'm layering it and then moving it around just like a flower arrangement. Because right? it's very hard to do something this complex by just sitting down and sketching it out. You need to be able to move those elements around. Okay, so the project I'm working on right now um, is one that a different artist had originally undertaken, but the client was unhappy with the artwork. So um, a company I work with approached me to do this. They, and they said it's a very sensitive subject. Um, we're depicting, depicting enslaved people escaping. And it, these have to be done accurately, seriously, and with compassion. Okay, so I was, I said, yeah, you know, maybe you can find someone better to do that. Uh, I don't, and, and this may seem surprising to you, you haven't seen all this artwork I've done, but I didn't know if I could do it because I don't really do people. I haven't done people in 20 years. And I was telling my wife about this and she said, you're telling me the client is already unhappy and you don't do people. You should be running the other way. So I thought about it and I said, you know, I don't believe in not doing stuff because it's scary or because it's difficult. So I, I accepted the project and I'm working on it. So I'm gonna show some of it to you here. So this is my initial sketch and I'm just roughing in the figures of this um, a slave person attempting to escape and some abolitionists are there to rescue him. And so that's as far as I got uh, with the sketches. And then I 
said, hey, Don, uh, you want to come out here? Uh, I need to, I'm going to strike some poses. So I'm getting in the poses that are going to be in this illustration here. So I got on my historic garb, my puppy shirt. And those are the two poses. And you can see that's me there. I put a lot of myself into my art. And this is from today. Um, that's that the, working on that illustration. These uh, paintings are all in sepia tone. Um, so that's the, that initial wash stage. I have completed some of these. Um, and I was pleased to discover I actually could do it. And some of these uh, uh, paintings are very high degree of difficulty when you have this many people depicted. Here's another one like that in, a, in quite a variety of poses. So that's been, it's been a real challenge, but um, I'm actually, when you're able to do something you didn't think you could, it's all the more gratifying. Okay, so to conclude, I'll go back to that um, uh, first day in college when uh, that professor also said, he told the class, we are not concerned with the London, we are artists. We are only concerned with the opinions of artists. I could not disagree more. Um, so my whole career has been um, about illustrating and getting people excited about the natural world and helping them learn about it. So that's what I've done and will continue to do so. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. I think we have some time for some questions. Dick. Can you do a lot of your narrative on the interpretive side? Sometimes I do the, the writing. The question is about the writing, the narrative on the signs, and whether Rom does that or not. Yeah, I probably do it uh, maybe 30% of the time. So oftentimes I'm part of a team. Sometimes it's with a writer and a designer, and then I just do the illustrations. Sometimes I do all of it. So it's really quite a mix. That was the background. Yeah, you have more background in science than you have in the particular <laughs> No comment. Uh, so uh, actually, it is a little bit of an issue. Sometimes, A lot of times the client provides the text. They just want to write it themselves. And... Um, well, let's just see. It, need, it needs some brushing up a lot of times. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so all those outdoor panels. Just yeah. the question is about preparing oh, sure. the surface so that it withstands the weather and all that sort of thing. Oh, that's a good point, uh, there, Dennis. You got to repeat the question. So, um, for the, for the zoom on it. Yeah, no, I'm getting it now. <laughs> I do the painting. I scan it into digital form. If I didn't just do it right on the screen, and then that gets fabricated into the sign. So what you're looking at is not the actual. Um, Artwork, it is um, usually those outdoor signs are either a, on an aluminum sign or a fiberglass laminate sign that is very weatherproof. And they're like guaranteed to last 10 years and they're graffiti resistant and so forth. So does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the, the ones on the highway are usually on a uh, aluminum product. And then the in, more interpretive signs along trails and so forth. Uh, and the ones I typically do are on a uh, fiberglass based um, product. So, yeah, Tim? Yeah. You're talking to a group of people who, uh, who are pretty good nature observers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're not part of our recreation. And what advice do you have for people who are pretty good observers but don't have much artistic talent? We try to kind of enjoy themselves, doing a little bit of drawing, a little bit of sketching, uh, just for their own recreation, not for a profit. 
this question is about you know how does a a person who doesn't have a lot of artistic skill kind of get involved in in drawing things to express their uh, notions about nature? So um, doing uh, field sketches of like birds and so forth is very difficult because they're moving around. You have the problem. You have to look at them through optics. So I would recommend starting with doing. Um, still life type drawings of getting whatever a pine cone or flowers or fo so forth things that won't run away and drawing those first and get more comfortable with that and you can do a lot with that and, and discover all sorts of things about these objects another word for sketching is to do a study and that's exactly what you're doing you're studying the object and getting to know it really well and examining all those shapes so that, that's where I would start by doing that still life type tech. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Pencil or um, something? Pencil would be the place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You've shown us a lot of beautiful artwork that you've done for clients. Uh, do you ever find time to do, uh, to create art just for you because you have certain things that you're passionate about? Okay, the question is, does Ram have time to do artwork just for himself that he doesn't necessarily get paid for, but just enjoys doing? Not um, not for the past 10 years or so. <laughs> so it's interesting. I want to bring up, you, you bring up an interesting point. When I was growing up, half the people said, are you crazy? You can't make a living as an artist. Yeah. The, it's like you're gonna there's the notion of a starving artist okay and then i had the other half of the people seeing like that tattoo drawing i did and they're like you're gonna be famous you're gonna be rich how could you be anything but an artist and it was like 50 50 okay so then the reality is that there are a lot of artists out there artists illustrators and so forth who basically have to just work really hard at it and make a living that's neither of those things. It's just like an average, maybe somewhat low scale wage is what you end up doing. Um, so I just wanted to share that. But to get back to your question, I spend so much time doing the stuff I'm hired to. It's pretty rare that I'll do anything just for fun. And it's usually for gifts. So I do that occasionally. But not, not so much just like because I go on these trips. I've done a number of these presentations, like all the toucans and all this. I don't really have much opportunity to come back and, and paint those things. Notice is and notice Ram's <laughs> pants, so if you want to know something that he probably didn't get paid too much to do those. Yeah, that's I painted these over 20 years ago. I know. I know. I like, yeah. Yes. Question. Will AI affect your work? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. So you know, I don't want to be left behind. I want to be up. That's why I started doing the drawings on the computer and so forth. So I've been checking this out recently. So AI, if you want a illustration of a sexy warrior princess, you can get AI to do that. No problem. You just type that in and it gives you a fabulous drawing. But then I type in um, something specific like... Uh, uh, something more applicable to I don't get commissioned to do a lot of sexy warrior princes. Um, so and and um, you know in these various services like Leonardo AI or some I type that in and it's just like useless. So um, you know maybe eventually that'll take over the work I'm the type of work I'm doing, but it's nowhere close to that yet. It's just very good for a very limited number of topics like those fantasy images of beautiful princesses and stuff okay does that answer your question yeah yeah, yeah so that washed ashore and um the woman i work with on that sea bass she has worked for them off and on through the years i think she's working for them currently so the, yeah, they're, they're, that's a very well-known outfit, yeah. Yeah, no, it's terrific. They, they do great stuff. Okay, I guess that's all. So, oh, well, one more. Yes, Jan. It's so 
Jigsaw puzzles? Oh, a question about jigsaw puzzles. Are any of Lam's images jigsaw puzzles? Yes. There's one that you might like that's of warblers. And uh, then there's one of geckos and poisonous snakes. <laughs> I don't know. I've maybe done done a handful of puzzles through the years. Yeah. Where do you get those? Cobblestone puzzles. Uh, I think is the the company. Cobble something. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. um, the Campbell Center here, by the way, has a lot of art classes too, and they have a lot of puzzles. They have a they, they're doing a puzzle out here all the time. But I've never seen one of Rom's. I'm going to make sure that they get one of Rom's puzzles here at the Campbell Center. Yes. There's another place where you can do pocket sketching, and it's a, a program on OPB at uh, two o'clock on Tuesdays, one o'clock. So uh, lots of ways for us to get involved in in drawing and uh, involving our own, using some of our own skills to to illustrate our own feelings about nature and things that we enjoy. So that's great. So let's give another warm, warm uh, thank you to Ron. And we will, we will definitely get Ron back for, for another program. That was really great. So.